Have you ever thought about what it would cost to send a ton of net needed medical supplies to East Africa? For a charity set up by a group of Seattle doctors, it was cost prohibitive. But then they found out about a special program offered through Boeing. King 5 Aviation Specialist Glenn Farley has the story. New at 6.30. Steve Sands plays a critical role in modern medicine. Everybody that goes over is a volunteer. He's not a doctor, not a nurse, but a certified biomedical equipment technician at Swedish Medical Center. And he shows us the type of anesthesia equipment used here in training that he will help set up at the Black Lion Public Hospital in Ethiopia. A hospital that needs equipment, medical and technical assistance. 20,000 pounds to be delivered by air for free. When a plane's delivered by Boeing, it usually flies out of here empty, empty. But what if you could fill that space, that cargo space with humanitarian supplies, the space under the floor where you normally sit? So actually in our shipment going now with Boeing are nine of these brand new state-of-the-art anesthesia carts. Some of the equipment is purchased with donated funds. Hospitals are helping out donating lightly used equipment for us that's light years ahead of what doctors in Addis Ababa have to work with. This over here is a stretcher that we use in the operating room. Dr. Julian Udelman is with Seattle Anesthesia Outreach, a small charity that along with Boeing and Ethiopian Airlines is trying to have a big impact on health care in East Africa. It's been a godsend for us. I mean, we're a small organization. Our total annual budget runs around $40,000. I mean, that wouldn't pay for one shipment. Uh, we've worked with over 150 um, different flights and 50 different customers. Elizabeth Warman helps coordinate the humanitarian flights. We work with organizations that have proven track records in those countries of destination so that we know that whatever it is that's going to be on that flight actually gets in country and gets into the, to the right hands. Doctors from the Northwest training new Ethiopian physicians with equipment and supplies shipped by air, saving lives. In Seattle, Glenn Farley, King 5 News. Seattle Anesthesia Outreach continues to send doctors, nurses, and other experts to Ethiopia. The humanitarian flight is expected to depart on Monday. We tend to take Seattle's top-rated medical facilities for granted. Hospitals such as Swedish Medical Center. It's known for highly skilled doctors and nurses, comprehensive care, state-of-the-art equipment, and philanthropists. Now obviously, a philanthropist is not a medical specialty, but rather a specialty of the heart. And as it turns out, there's an incredible humanitarian mission with roots right here at Swedish that stretches halfway around the world. Ethiopia is located in the heart of East Africa, a nation rich in culture, but economically destitute. It's among the world's poorest countries. Nowhere is that poverty more evident than in the health care system. Yeah. In the capital of Addis Ababa, the only place where the poor can receive care is the government-run Black Lion Hospital. This hospital, it's, it's beyond description. It's hard to convey to Americans what this is like, and unless you see it with your own eyes, you, you, there's no way you can really get it. Dr. Richard Salazi is a Seattle anesthesiologist who has practiced at Swedish for 25 years. He co-founded SAO, Seattle Anesthesia Outreach. The group works in several developing countries. But when Salazi first visited the Black Lion in 2010, his life was forever changed. I'll tell you, my, my reaction was either go big or go home because they had so many problems. Salazi chose to go big. In less than a year, he was back in Ethiopia with a small army of doctors, nurses, and technicians from Swedish. Their goal? To bring the Black Lion out of the Dark Ages. We talk about the fact that there's not hot water available in the hospital. Basic things like that, basic amenities, things that we take for granted, never mind hospital issues, sort of basic hygiene issues, basic cleanliness. Uh, it's such a, a world away and almost a century away. Swedish 
has uh, about 95 anesthesiologists in the country of Ethiopia, which is very close to 80 million people. There are, we think, about 16 anesthesiologists in the country. So we have multiples more here in one hospital and multiple hospitals in King County. So yeah, the, the discrepancy is huge. Remember I marked it? So we're gonna leave it right there. Until SAO arrived on the scene, women had never had epidurals available during labor and delivery. And C-sections were done only under general anesthesia, which is considered unsafe. They did not have a recovery room process at all when we arrived. Wow, a lot of hostomy backs. The Americans dug in, transforming a moldy old storage area into a first-class recovery room. We were very, very much astonished by the kind of help these people uh, are providing because uh, Seattle and Addis Ababa are, you know, half the globe far apart. They were certainly surprised and it gave us some credibility that we were willing to just really work hard, that we weren't there just to stand and observe and direct them how they should behave or what they should be doing, but we were actually physically going to make this happen. We've established this recovery room, we've set up monitors so that we can monitor the patient's EKG, their oxygenation, their blood pressure, and with our oxygen saturation monitors we can monitor that and see that she's adequately oxygenated. It's so unlike here. There is no comparison to be made and we get the Cadillac version and they wait for days to see if they might have a resolution to their problem and uh, death is very common. Almost all the equipment we've taken there from here has been donated by Swedish hospital. Anesthesia machines, gurneys, monitors. And in this room, shelves of anesthesia supplies donated by Swedish. Everything from laryngeal masks to disposable syringes. Initially, they were looking at shipping all this equipment to Ethiopia through Djibouti, which was going to be very expensive and take very long. And, and then it turned out that we found out that Boeing does deliveries to airlines and they will take humanitarian supplies for free on those flights. And so we were able to hook up with Boeing and Ethiopian Airlines. Oh, those are um, Swiss operating room tables that we bought from the U.S. Army. They're Army surplus field operating room tables. Eight tons number sort of says it a little bit in that it's substantial equipment. It is not tape and gauze. We've sent uh, anesthesia machines and defibrillators and patient monitors and um, all sorts of sort of pretty substantial support things. Five brand new operating room tables, operating room lights. We're very proud of them and honored to have our medical staff and employees um, doing such great work overseas in areas that really need their work. Another primary goal is to make the Black Lion a strong teaching hospital. You can always comfort her and let her know that she's here and that, that she's in recovery. They forget, very forgetful, and let her know that she's going to be okay. Even with dramatic improvements in care, training, and equipment, the hospital faces yet another huge challenge. One of the things that surprised us was how fragile the infrastructure was in terms of, you know, the, the heating and the lighting and the electricity and that sort of thing being major issues in terms of uh, provision of medical care in Black Lion. Ancient boilers wheeze, hiss, and routinely fail. That means no hot water, and surgeries for people who've been waiting for days must be canceled. In the basement, there's standing water where corroded pipes leak onto electrical wires. A lot of them have had water dripping on them forever. They originally put these supports in, which was state of the art, but they've all rusted through. In one day, this hospital could close the doors because it's that fragile. Yeah. Outside, the horrors continue. The hospital's sewage treatment system failed years ago. All of the sewage from the hospital comes down through this stream. The sewage treatment, which is over here, which are through the trees you can't quite see, is completely broken, so nothing is treated. And it comes down and it ends up in the, in the rivers in the city. There are times that Salazi feels absolutely hopeless, that the needs are just too overwhelming. 
it's just impossible. But the hope comes when I look back and we see we've given them a recovery room and we've got residents in anesthesia now and their turnover times in surgery are better, they have better equipment, they're enthused. Um, so in our short little time there, we feel like we've really made some tangible progress. And the Americans feel it is not they who inspire, but rather their Ethiopian colleagues who do so much with so little. I met with the residents this morning and a bunch of the staff and uh, you know, doctors here make very little money and they're very dedicated and nice and people are happy and it's just really, I think the people are what's awesome here. And we'd like to keep going. We want to sustain this for 20 years and at 20 year mark, I think we could look back and say, gee, we really made a difference. Well, it's our honor to be here. Thank you so much for allowing us to come. And I don't think there's anything unique about any of us that go. It's just that once you've been exposed to that and you see our lifestyle, you see what we have, and you see the disparity, it's really hard to turn your back and walk away. So this morning I arrived and there's um, an elective C-section for PIH, but we don't even know why she's going to have a C-section actually. So we start getting her ready um, and we take her to a labor room and we're going to start an epidural on her. And I do a blood pressure and it's um, 191 over 118. Yeah. So we take another blood pressure and it's even higher with uh, diastolics now, um, 120s. Um, and then I ask the patient if she has a headache. Yes, she has a headache. And I asked the resident when she last did labs and it was one week ago. So I flipped through the chart and I actually found she's a diabetic. No one knew that. No one knew she was on insulin. So now she's moved to the OR. We got the epidural in, still with high blood pressures. So then I put the blood pressure cuff on and there's a leak in the actual cuff. Um, and so she needs a new cuff. So we go running around trying to find a new blood pressure cuff for the big anesthesia machine and I'm told there are no more cuffs. And I'm given by the head nurse, I'm given a manual cuff to take her blood pressure every three minutes. Okay, now just walking through the hospital for you on a daily basis, what would you say are some of the more obvious improvements that need to be made? Mm -hmm. uh, we should have uh, three or four hospitals as big as this in the city. The number of patients should decrease. I'm forced to see 40, 45 patients in one afternoon. You can imagine the quality of care I'm giving. Uh, the challenge in the obstetric field is that uh, we have a very limited bed, very old beds, and we have got a higher referral because this is uh, like the only tertiary uh, level care that's available in, the, in this country. And this is the only hospital that gynecologic malignancy is also managed. And with the limited number of beds that we have, this makes uh, it a huge challenge for us. Uh, after the innovation, we have left with so many problems. The sewerage system is terrible. You know, the electrical system, you know, or our central facilities. You know, when uh, 40 years back, this hospital used to have like a central oxygen system, central vacuum system. Now, all of them are non-functional. It used to have like, you know, uh, hot water supply for every room. But now, you know, the majority of uh, the systems are failing. This is critical. The, their systems are so far deteriorated that any week, any month, this hospital could have to shut down completely. It's hard to imagine a tragedy like that when you figure this is it for 10 million people or something. As far as lacking organ, I know that you're, part of your job is implementing organizational structure. Right. What are some of the things here that you think would surprise people back in the States? Uh, how many boxes of supplies that people have sent that maybe are not usable? There's so many supplies here and they're not using them because I think they don't know how to use them. So that goes along with education. You can send supplies, but if they don't know how to use them or what they're for, it doesn't work. For the most part, the challenge is getting uh, the old equipment out that needs to just be um, surplused and taken apart and um, disposed of properly. There's quite a few anesthesia. In October, the beginning of November, they had all kinds of storage rooms with 
the equipment that did not work. The first thing I noticed, the equipment did not have trunk cables for the SpO2. They had lots of SpO2 saturated some oxygen for the blood, but they didn't have the patient cable, the interface cable to the equipment. So it was not going to work no matter what you could have done to it. Without that patient module, it was useless. The batteries hadn't been replaced since 96 on a lot of the equipment that was donated by some places in um, other countries. So it was like they were trying to get rid of stuff and the easiest so they didn't have to pay disposal is what I, what I feel. There's no ventilators. Or if they are, they're safe for people who are so sick. People are kind of, we're used to putting on a ventilator with all our resources. They don't have those resources. So it's much more a sink or swim thing here. And they leave the operating room and they essentially go to their family's care. And complicated surgeries need more than that. This hospital needs a lot more than any hospital I've seen in the U.S. And I know that there are places, there are pockets in the U.S. that are in dire need, but uh, this hospital really has absolutely nothing. I think in the third world countries, <clears throat> they face death a lot more often than we do, and I think there's a different attitude toward disease that I think plays into some of these issues that we see in the hospital. I think in the United States, we're always on our guard and providing the best possible care we can, whereas in some of these countries, I think there's a little bit more of a laissez-faire attitude that is part of the culture as a whole, that death and disease is much more prevalent and accepted in the society. And perhaps I think that leads to some of the things we see in the hospital. After initially meeting with the department here, we set up some goals with them to achieve. Um, the first goal was to establish an obstetric epidural anesthesia service. The second, and I think the most important, was to establish a, what we call a PACU, a post-anesthesia care unit. And the third was to supply them with new anesthesia machines and monitoring equipment for their operating theaters. The goals with this room is just to give it some organization. So our, our goal is to go in and then put a system in place where they can start using it. Partly through, we made connection with the uh, construction company working at the embassy, and they came in and. They took it from our efforts. I am the chief uh, clinical engineer biomed for this project. I'm the only biomed that came on the project to install all the medical equipment that was donated by the United States from our hospital at Swedish. Um, I brought eight anesthesia machines that I've been maintaining for 10 years in America and um, bought 13 monitoring systems and installed them all over here for the ORs to standardize the ORs with the same monitor and anesthesia machine. That That's a spare monitor. That's yeah, not yeah. a bad monitor. That's a yeah. You just take the bezel off the other one and put it on that. Okay, okay that's a brand new monitor. And they had a patient here in the OR, a pediatric case that they did brain surgery on, and they did not have a ventilator available that could do pediatrics in the ICU. They were out of adult ventilators, pediatric ventilators. They did not have a single ventilator to maintain this patient. They could not move this patient out of the OR until they had a way to ventilate the patient that was in a coma. We used one of the anesthesia machines that I just put together and I rolled an anesthesia machine down to the ICU into the adult ICU because the pediatric ICU has never had a ventilator and would not have known how to use it. So we put an anesthesia machine in the ICU for them to ventilate the patient and keep her alive. I need to have a place to plug it in. Can you tell me some of the biggest challenges of working with this hospital? Um, the power. There's um, it, a lot of the rooms might have only one or two outlets that are actually working. We have, um, yeah, some electrical capability, but I think we're going to need to redo some of those circuits, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 At least we have the four compressed air and oxygen. Yeah. Essentially. Uh, there is no house gas here. So for compressed, you're running off tanks too, probably now. The only medical gas they have is oxygen. 
They do not have any of the other gases. They're only using 100% O2. Equipment came from a variety of sources. SAO purchased a significant amount of the equipment with money that came for our donors. Proudly, we've really stretched our pennies. Our overhead is very low. And also Swedish Hospital. Uh, Rod Hockman, the CEO, has been really supportive. The hospital has donated a lot of equipment that has been scheduled for replacement anyway, and it's been reconditioned and cleaned up and sent. So that's a big percentage of the equipment came from there also. This group from the CAA See, Seattle's uh, anesthesia organization have supplied to us developing a knowledge base, especially working with Steve is very pleasant to our group, I hope so. Probably the fifth major thing that this mission has done is uh, build the capacity of our biomedical unit, which was a huge bottleneck in this hospital, especially with maintaining equipment. And I believe now they have got the state-of-the-art equipment to test machineries, and they have trained young technicians to maintain this equipment. So now I think is the time with the hospital officials that we are going to create an awareness that we have got a unit that's going to be responsible for the medical equipment, machineries, and uh, I think we are going to develop even on handling of equipment, you know. No one is supposed to touch a machine without knowing how it works. How's she doing, guys? This is an amazing moment at the Black Line. This is the first patient in the recovery room since, as far as we know, ever. She does need volume. Um, do we know? Is she putting on any urine at all? Yeah. What we've done is we've established this recovery room. We've set up monitors so that we can monitor the patient's EKG, their oxygenation, their blood pressure. 43 over 45 And with our oxygen saturation monitors, we can monitor that and see that she's adequately oxygenated. We're maintaining her blood pressure. We're watching it every three to four minutes. We're watching her EKG to make sure she stays stable hemodynamically. Two liters. So she's had two liters. She bled 1.6. And 1.6. So I think we could give her some more volume if she's down. This would be the first time that a family member uh, has made it, their way into the perioperative department here at the Black Line. It's generally forbidden, but we have just started a recovery room, and so uh, some of the standards are, are probably going to change, and this might be one of them. Was there a little resistance for the nurses to bring the mother Actually, in? Actually, um, there was a little bit of resistance, but uh, the, the most resistance came from the mother. She, uh, she was uh, more frightened about how uh, it would be received, how she would be received here in this department. So. And how do you think this is going to change the way the recovery room is operating? I think it will change the way pediatrics is done.